Today we are going to do a uh, flyover of um, the Doctrines of Grace, and if you were at the Reformation um, serv uh, service this year, uh, some of the pastors went through and gave a brief synopsis of each of the points that we're going to talk about today, so that was, that was good. If you, if you went there, you're going to kind of get a refresher, and I hope that today that if you have not been introduced to the doctrines in a formal sense, that you'll kind of get a, a better understanding appreciation, but also um, an understanding of kind of where uh, a foundation of our church looks at the doctrine of salvation. This is kind of our starting point, biblical starting point. The Reformation um, kind of went back to the roots of biblical theology on salvation, back to what Augustine looked at and what the early church fathers looked at and what Paul teaches. And so I want tonight, today to be an introduction, an overview, but also an appreciation as they are, since they're called the doctrines of grace, an appreciation of God and His grace and what He's done for us um, in that way. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you that you've given us life, that you, each of us here, we woke up, you've given us a sound of mind. We may have struggles, we may have hurts. We may have pains, but you are Lord and you're our Savior, you're our God. We thank you for the doctrines that we're going to talk about today and that we're going to discuss. We thank you that they, you've revealed these things in, in the scriptures, and even though we might not understand how they all play out in the big scheme of things, we understand that you're good and that you're kind. So we pray these things, that you would help us, Holy Spirit, and guide our conversation and our thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is lesson 12. All right. I like flowers. I'm not really particular to tulips. But why, tell me why am I showing tulips for the doctrines of grace? That is a, okay, the acronym TULIP. Okay, if you, we're going to talk about that. It's not necessarily a biblical flower like the lilies of the field or the rose of Sharon and I don't know if you see tulip in the Bible, <laughs> but you, we have used this term tulip to describe the doctrines of grace, and we'll see that in your handout. You kind of see the, the anacronym spelled out there in the highlighted um, version down through the big, biblical support and sig significance, but there's also something else that kind of is interesting in terms of history of why, why, why the, fl the flower picture of tulip? Why, why a tulip? Anyone... Besides the fact that it's an acronym that fits the doctrines of Scripture, why a tulip? Yeah, yeah. From, Holland, yeah from Holland, okay. And so this whole understanding of the, con the controversy or the discussion on the doctrines of grace and why there even became an articulation in this way, it came from, um, from a Dutch, the Dutch Reformed um, Church and the, the Dutch Reformed conversation after the Reformation. So what are the doctrines of grace? And I'm going to... These are my definitions based upon my reading. I'm making them real simple. An explanation of the doctrine of salvation is set forth in Scripture. So how has God revealed to us in Scripture, in His Word, how He has saved mankind, men and women? How has He brought us into a, a relationship with Him? We have this problem, but how does God solve that problem? How does He plan from the beginning of time to do this? That's my definition of the doctrines of grace. And what I want to kind of get across today in our discussion is a perspective issue. What is your starting point? When we think about salvation and how God has saved you and how you've realized that Jesus Christ has died for your sins and cleansed you and he's done all the work, how, what's your starting point? Is it a man-centered theology or perspective? Or is it a God-centered theology or perspective? And so the question that we're kind of dealing with today is how does our understanding of salvation affect our Christian experience and our daily walk from our perspective of God's salvation? Do you think, does you think, it, do you think it matters? Okay, I, I see some yeses, okay? All right? It does matter. I'm going to make the point that I think it does matter. But I'm also going to make another point about perspective. Now, most of us, how many of you here can ha have a driver's license and drive a car? 
Well, most of us do. How many of you drive a Mercedes? Okay, no, not many of you. How many would like to drive a Mercedes? It might be good. Why? Because it's a quality car. It's a nice car. Maybe it's the prestige. I don't know. But it's a good, quality, well-built car. It's going to last probably longer than a Ford Taurus. All of us in here, all of us in here can drive a car. And we have a driver's license. Now, how many of us in here understand how the car actually runs underneath the hood? How many of us can actually say we're kind of a mechanic, we understand that there are little miniature explosions going on, you know, underneath the hood? I don't quite know how that all works, but it does. Okay? So my point in perspective is that all of us, we can drive a car. It's our car. We own it. It's ours. But not all of us understand under the hood how it all works. That doesn't make us any less of a driver. It doesn't make us any less of an owner of that car, does it? We just don't know how it all works because we don't have maybe the understanding or we haven't taken the time to study it. But it, it's, the perspective is that for all, from our man-centered perspective, we're still the owner of that car and we enjoy it and we drive it. That's our experience, right? So when we talk about the doctrines of grace and how God saves us, most of us are the starting point from our perspective is that we're the driver, we have the faith, God has given us the faith, it's a real thing in our lives. But we don't necessarily know how and understand all the deeper ramifications of how what's going on underneath, going on underneath the hood, what God has done, how he saved us. All right. So when we talk about the doctrines of grace, we're kind of open up the God's word and we're kind of understanding what's under the hood, how it works, how God has said it works. That doesn't make us, if we don't understand it, and if we don't actually agree with every little minuscule point, doesn't mean we're any less of a driver necessarily. Now, there are ramifications if you start embracing certain doctrines, going down certain roads. I mean, if you think that you own a car that says it needs gas and you keep putting diesel fuel in it, you got some problems. <laughs> okay, the same, so analogies break down after a while. But, you, but my point is that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that don't hold to the doctrines of grace in every point that we would say that our church does, that they might be considered, oh, Arminian. Ooh, ooh. You know what? But they might drive the car better, and they might actually have stronger faith than we do because they know the owner who gave them that car. Okay? That's the point I want to kind of understand as we talk about the doctrines. I don't want to make it got to have an intellectual, perfect understanding of everything or even embrace everything because I didn't grow up embracing the doctrines of grace we're taught it and there are some points that i struggle with intellectually and that you know what that's okay if your perspective is god-centered i want to know god i want to know how he saves me i want to know what jesus has done so brief overview we want to get into a little bit how how the articulation of the doctrines of grace happened in church history so this is a flyover but for some of us a brief history here if you, read the, you know, if you read Paul's letters, this is where a lot of the doctrines are um, expounded in Scripture, of understanding how God saves, how his plan unfolds. All right? Now, of course, Paul is not just coming out of his head and putting this down on paper. It's the Holy Spirit, and it also kind of, it kind of matches what the Old Testament says. Okay? Paul kind of, that's the way the Bible works. But then as you go into early church history, you see a, a famous discussion between Augustine and Pelagius. Now, Pelagius was a, one of the uh, preachers at the time, and Pelagius had an issue of, he, was, he denied that human nature had been corrupted by sin. He said that there's enough good in man, that man can actually do good, and God sees that good, and because he sees that good, he shows favor to him. Now, I'll give you an encounter example. I've been teaching my kids and going through Advent and talking to them about the different covenants, and and the point about when God comes to Abraham and gives him the covenant, and says, I'm going to bless you. Abraham isn't following God. Abraham's not a righteous man. God shows favor to him from ground zero because God shows favor to him. And so the starting point is God again. But Pelagius got it wrong. So you have a, this famous discussion between Augustine and Pelagius about where, you know, how fallen is man and what's man's ability to choose God or be saved or be part of that salvation process, okay? And so um, Pelagianism would be man can do it. Man can reach up to God. He has enough good that he can do it. 
All right? Well, then you come into more of the Reform time and the Reformation time, and you're not man named Jacob Arminius, or sometimes he's just na- labeled James. He's Dutch Reformed Church in 1593. He preaches a sermon on Romans 9, and it's, you know, so Romans 9 deals with pre- predestination and election. And he preaches it, and it's not just exactly the same flavor that all the reformers are doing. Not, it's not very as Calvinistic as Calvin is. And so there becomes this little debate of what's going on here. And, and it's, you know, people are bringing up, wait a minute, he's not right on the doctrine of election and doctrine of predestination. And Arminius insisted that he was only trying to protect the church from the extremes of Calvinism, the extremes of just thinking that God does all this choosing and that there's no responsibility on man's part. And so I put two words there, superlapsarian and infralapsarianism. Can anyone tell me that, what one each means? This is, if you know it, doesn't mean, might mean you don't know too much. They're, they're theologians. If you're supra, what are you saying? Right. When, when, the question is, when did God choose the elect? In his mind and plan of salvation, did he choose the elect before the fall, because he knew the fall was going to happen, or after the fall, knowing, and he's still knowing who's going to choose him and not? It, it's one of those theological questions that can blow your mind and makes you frustrated if you're even thinking about it. But certain people are gifted in going down those roads and trying to say, look, it does have implications. So... Arminius is saying, look, I'm thinking hyper-Calvinism, frozen chosen, you guys are not having any kind of human responsibility. I'm thinking he's trying to counter that, all right? So he starts out in not a bad direction. He's trying to, trying to counter an extreme, and, and often in church history, what you'll see is if someone's trying to counter one extreme, the pendulum switches, and sometimes it goes too far, all right? So you have this debate here, you have this conflict going back and forth, and so his Declaration of Sentiments in 1608 is basically his summary of his, what his theology is. And then the Calvinists come back in the Senate of Dort in 1618 and they say, okay, this is what we believe Scripture's teaching, and that's where we get the doctrines of TULIP. That's where TULIP kind of comes from. So if you look at your sheet and you look up here, I kind of have summarized it. So the summary of Arminius, the Declaration of Sentiments, he basically has five articles, and I list them in order that he listed them, and they don't match up with TULIP perfectly. They don't spell it out correctly if you look at your paper. But first of all, man is, this is Arminius' view. This is a point he was, he was proposing, that man is so depraved that divine grace is necessary unto faith or good deeds. So he said, he's not denying that, he's not like Pelagius, all right? He is saying that man is, he's spiritually sick. He needs God's grace to be saved. But he doesn't go as far as the reformers would go. The reformers said that we're not sick, we're spiritually dead. A dead man can't do anything until God does something to him, until God makes him alive. So see the little difference there, all right? So he's more, and when we think of Arminius, we think of more of, he's more of a semi-Pelagian, you know, he's not all the way. All right, then go down to the next one. God's divine grace may be resisted, okay? His point is that, look, people can't, because, I mean, he's he's thinking, again, in terms of the perspective from man-centered, human experience, all right? And the Reformers are saying their doctrine is coming from a God-centered biblical perspective. Well, how does does it look in Scripture? But there there is going to be that tension, because we do have human experience is very much part of our reality, but our reality has to be shaped by God's reality and his word and his revelation. So he says that God's grace, divine, divine grace can be resisted. The reformers say that no, that when God does a work and he starts doing something in your life, you cannot resist God's grace. Because guess what? God's all powerful and he's going to do what he's planned to do. All right? Then God's elect or God, God elects or reproves on the basis of foreseen faith, okay, a conditional election. He's, and this is a limited atonement doctrine that he's countering kind of. This is, a, this is a challenging doctrine to embrace even from the reform perspective, for, logically for us. It's hard for us to kind of, there's a tension here. So he's saying that what God does in terms of election and predestination, he knows 
He can see the future. He says, Jim, I know you're going to have faith, and therefore I choose you. All right? The reform perspective is God says, no, before time, Zach, I'm choosing you. You're my child. And because I've chosen you, then you will have faith. I will give you faith, and you will come to salvation. Different perspective, you know, different perspective. One's a God-centered starting point. The other is, uh, man, somehow, you know, man shapes kind of the, the decision factor. And then at the end here, um, perseverance of the faith, actually, for Arminius, he wasn't clear. He didn't make a defined statement. You could have told him, sorry. You could have, he didn't make a defined statement whether or not someone could fall away once they were truly a believer. Now, he would argue that from the experience perspective, there's a lot of people that come into the church, say they have true faith, and then fall away. But from the divine sovereignty perspective of what God's plan of salvation is, if it, he, it says he's, there's none of his sheep that he's going to lose. All right? See the, see the difference of perspective here. I don't want you to look, and at the end I'm going to give you an example, I don't want you to look at everyone who says, well, I'm an Arminian because I kind of adhere to these, these distinctions. As someone who is totally unsaved, unorthodox, doesn't know how to follow Jesus, and doesn't have true faith. I don't want you to look at it that way. But I want you to see that there are some consequences. Like, the doctrines of grace are beautiful because of the perspective. And it should help us, and it should spur us on to good works. Um, so, any questions about, those are kind of the, how it all came about in church history, and how we got the tulip and the specifics. Okay? So, just uh, as a refresher, to put it down in a simple point, the biblical support and significance of the doctrines of grace. So you have T for total or radical depravity. And I'm going to start out and just go through the traditional way of the, they've been articulated. And I'm going to use some of those other words there because I think they may be helpful. Um, unconditional or sovereign election. Um, limited or definite atonement. Irresistible or amazing grace. And then perseverance of the saints. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm not going to have to spend a lot of time. In fact, I probably, I might mention some of these verses if I remember them by memory. I'm not going to go, we're not going to open up and go through them. Um, but they're in, their, they're in their handout there. And I'm going to have the definition. Then I want, I want a little bit of a brief discussion on just how does this truth affect our, our view of God and ourselves? Like how, and some of us, some of us, maybe if you're hearing this for the first time or you haven't really wrestled with some of these concepts, you don't know. So just listen to what other saints who have gone before have maybe this is how it's impacted our life this is how it's changed our mindset about what god has done for us so total or radical depravity because of the fall mankind is completely touched and affected by sin and all that he is in his nature he's completely fallen but he's not as bad as he could be there's still common grace we we're not devils <laughs> All right, we, we still have the image of God in us somehow. It's fallen, it's corrupted, it's, it's marred. We're not in relationship with God the way we should be or the way we were meant to be. But so, it's ra so I think radical sometimes is helpful to think of in terms of total makes you think of, well, we're just, oh, we're just so bad. But in one sense, I like the concept of total because it means that we are so desperate, we need really, we need life. We need God's help. You know, it's not just, ah, you know, I, I, maybe there's something, there's a spark within me that can, can ignite the, God's faith. God has to do the work. So, um, we, that verse in Jeremiah 17, 9 there, the unbelievable believer is deceitful and wicked. That's a verse about the heart. Sometimes we take that verse and apply it to believers. And I want to say that that, true, that is true of unbelievers. For, an un, for us who have a new heart... It should be changed. It should be going a different direction. All right, but for the unbeliever, that's the condition we are. And then if you wrote Romans 3, we know that there's none good. No one wants good. No one wants God. We're all in rebellion against God from, starting, from our starting point. I have put there um, the Westminster and Baptist London Confession where they're found. And I, the reason I put Westminster and Baptist together is because the Baptist kind of came out of the Westminster. They're the same, same line, same chapters and verses and um, same language, so same history of the Re Reformation. So how, give me, someone give me an idea of how does this truth, understanding this 
doctor and affect our view of God in ourselves. Yes, Kathy. We can have no pride hmm. and we realize how full of the promise hmm. we have and seek to chase the past things. Yes, so it, we don't have a place for pride. And we're 100% to, total de, dependent upon God's work in our life. And that should give us, that should spur us on to gratitude and thanksgiving. And, and, it's, and it's hard from, from my experience and growing up in an Arminian background or a background that didn't teach these doctrines forthrightly is that it's hard sometimes to say, you know what? I really, it was God who did a miracle in my life. Because we like to think, well, I did something to find God. Like, I'm smarter than so-and-so down the street. <laughs> really? You know, or the reason why I embrace faith because it made sense to me, but something had to change in your heart. Something, and it is a pride issue sometimes when you just think it's, about, it's still man-centered, it's my-centered. Um, okay, any other thoughts? We don't have much time, so I'm just kind of going along. I don't think, one, of the, one thing that this, this doctrine <laughs> is one doctrine that I never had to really teach at the gospel mission, because everyone knows that everyone's a sinner. <laughs> everyone knows that we have problems. The problem is that I realize is that they didn't want to say that the problem was within their heart. They wanted to say that, yeah, everything's broken and fallen and sinful and needs Jesus, but it's really their fault. It's the government's fault. It's my, my mother did this. My dad did this. It's realizing the total depravity is in, in here, is in the individual, as we're born of Adam. All right, unconditional sovereign election. Read Ephesians 1, and I don't think you should even question some of this. Ephesians 1 is one of the best chapters on this understanding. So God's choice of certain individuals for salvation was not based on any foreseen response of obedience on their part, but was based solely in his good and sovereign will. This is something God desires and wants and had planned to do from the very beginning. Yes, there is that hard question that we don't know how to answer why did God even allow the fall if he knew it was all going to happen? That's a hard question. Well, from logically, I mean, if you, logically from a human perspective. Yeah, from you, but if you consider the fact that we exist, because it's God's creation, not ours. Right. He is doing what he's doing. So there's no, I don't think yeah, no. Well, because you have embraced and you have faith in his, elect, in his sovereign will and who he is. Yeah, he created everything. He knew right. what was going to happen. He knew what it for a purpose. Your starting point is God. Right. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I, I've also heard other people say if you grew up in other cultures, <clears throat> there are more used to living under authority. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to start with God. You just have to start, start with, with being more comfortable with being under authority. Right. Right, right. Uh, anyway. And, and we, uh, yeah, our culture makes it harder from the natural man's perspective to begin to think in these terms. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> so how does this truth then then how does this truth shape your life into you know on a, on a daily basis and your love for christ and your how can this truth help yes i'm just really glad it's not based on me yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of pressure and i right. i would be very insecure yeah. the fact that it's not based on me makes me secure yeah your, where is your security where is your hope it's not a it's not about <laughs> Well, Cindy, you've got to be good enough. Cindy, you have to measure up. It's totally sovereign love on you because God wants you to be part of his plan. Yeah. And I'm disappointed in myself, but God's not surprised. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, There's Jeff. a flip side problem to that, 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 I, that I raised <coughs> in my prison ministry uh, because the people that I minister to quite often could not believe God would have a need for them at all. So if you say it's all of God, too soon, they right. know they're not, they, right. they know they're yeah. right, they can't be saved. No, that's a very good point. So we, when, we talk, when we talk to unbelievers, I think sometimes us who are in, in love with the, these kinds of doctrines, and the articulation of these doctrines, and we have a solid theology underneath our belts, we make the mistake of trying to teach them what's under the hood 
before they even learn what, how to drive a car. Like, we need, to, we need to say, look, guys, look at Jesus. Look at you, you know, they're not going to deny the fact that they have a sin problem. Now, they might deny the fact that it's their problem. But they, you know, teach the basics. Like, some of these doctrines are heavy, deep doctrines to embrace, as a, especially as an unregenerate heart. God can do anything. And he can do that work. But when we talk to unbelievers, sometimes trying to describe how that engine works all at once is like trying to just give them an, it's an overload of data. And it, it makes them go down paths they don't understand. They, don't, they need the foundation that what? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And Jesus said that to someone who actually knew the Old Testament pretty well, Nicodemus. Jesus starts out pretty basic. You know, and this is Paul explaining these kinds of doctrines to people that have embraced Jesus already. So think of that. I, because I sometimes have, you know, you, you automatically want to correct someone's theology when they're still a really immature Christian and you think they're embracing Christ. And that sometimes can be, lead down rabbit roads, rabbit trails. So good. This, this is a doctrine that if you, as a Christian, this should make you really when you deal with guilt or you're not feeling like you're loved by God, things aren't going to plan you, like you want them to go, you realize this, God has a plan. He's done this. It's not based upon my performance in terms of being brought into his family. He loves me, and he's going to guide me and direct me. So if you love, Ephesians 1, Paul is doing that exact thing to the Ephesians church. He wants them to understand this, that they're children of God and there's a plan. We have the we have the Holy Spirit given to us as a down payment. All right, limited atonement or definite atonement. This is the hard, one of the hardest doctrines for a lot of people to, to, to get their mind around or to maybe say they really, really love or embrace. And as you, you sometimes hear, well, I'm a four-point Calvinist. Well, this is usually the point that's not checked, all right? And this is a point where you can get too, I think, too much into detail and trying to understand how it all plays out in our experience. But I think logically that it, it is something that tells you about what Christ is doing. When he dies on the cross, he is making a payment, and it is an exact payment, a, a ransom for his children to be rescued. The picture of the Old Testament is that, that the Old Testament coming, the, the people of Israel coming out of Egypt that God's plan is not just to say it's a potential salvation that you may choose, but God has a definite. That's why the word definite instead of limited. Limited is negative, but definite is God's saving. His blood covers all his children. All his sheep are coming to his fold because the payment is paid. The price has been delivered. All right? So I like what Francis Turretin says. If you read any of his works, that his, Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for all. In other words, it has unlimited power. He's God, but is efficacious or is only effective for the elect, for those who God has chosen. All right? And so I won't, let me just read this quickly because this may be helpful in terms of how you might define a debt or sin. But Christ's blood was sufficient for all, but not all sin was imputed to Christ. Christ's blood is sufficient to cover all people, the power, the immensity. The sufficiency relates to his divine value, which is different than our legal debt. Sin is debt, since it is breaking God's, the law of God. Limited atonement means that there was a limit to whose sins were imputed to Christ in a legal sense, which is not a denial of the sufficiency of God, Christ's blood to cover all people, since the key focus is the legal aspect of the sin debt. Believers, all those who are elect that come to Jesus, their sin debts were transferred to Jesus and were canceled on the cross. If the debt is canceled, it does not exist and cannot be held against the debtor or the sinner, which is the, for the believer. Therefore, Christ only legally bore the sins of the elect, even though his blood was sufficient to cover all. So when we try to understand this doctrine and we look at John 3, 16, we may blow circuits in our mind because it says that for God so loved the world that he sent his son, that anyone, all, okay, all the world. But then again, you have to re understand that God's plan, this is under the hood. This is what God, this is how we understand that scripture is revealing. 
Because if you start going down the road that his blood covers all people, what can you, where can you go with that? What happens intellectually and theologically? Right. It becomes, it can't, it becomes man-centered, but also even farther than that, where you get into unorthodoxy. <laughs> yeah, it's the universalism. That at the end of the age, it's Christ's sacrifices for everybody, and no matter how you lived, you're going to be okay because it's all about grace. Unless you read the rest of the Bible. <laughs> right, right, but if you, that's why I'm saying <laughs> read things in context, the whole Bible. Okay. All right, let me keep, uh, any other, one other question is that for anyone in this room, how has this doctrine shaped your view of God and, and yourself and, and helped you in your walk with Jesus? If this doctrine has, maybe this is a doctrine you haven't really wrestled with or thought about much. Yes? One thing I heard one time which really opened up to me was, unless you're a universalist, everybody limits the atonement. Yeah. Are you going to limit the scope or are you going to limit the power? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And he says that unless you're a universalist, which means that everyone's coming into heaven because Jesus died for them, you're either going to limit the scope of how much, how many people are going to be affected by it, or the power of the sacrifice. Um, so again, this is not a doctrine. This is one of those things under the hood where I don't actually understand what a catalytic converter does and how it works. Paul DeHart does. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand why you had to smell sulfur, you know. But I know it works. This, I know it works for sure. And I know that God's sacrifice and his, his, his sacrifice is, is accomplishing exactly what God wants it to accomplish. That's why Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished. The head of the serpent is crushed. Irresistible grace. Uh, this one, I think we all should like and we should really appreciate. Everyone God the Father has chosen and everyone God the Father... Son has died for will be effectually and savingly called by the Holy Spirit, resulting in regeneration and faith in Jesus Christ. So God's grace, and this the argument here is that you cannot resist God's grace. If He's going to, if He's going to bring you into His family, He's going to do it. Uh, and, and the illustration I think of my mind when I think of um, irresistible grace is not only my own testimony and and how God has been gracious and and stuff, but I think of the testimony of C.S. Lewis, where he says the hounds of heaven were after him. Like, he did not want, he fought against God the whole way. He went through World War I, he saw the evils of World War I. He did not want to embrace the gospel. He wanted every philosophical argument out there, and every real, he wanted to know what reality was based upon man's understanding. And yet he says he finally, the hounds of heavens were pursuing him, and he finally had to get on his knees and say, God is God. And that's, I mean, some of our stories can relate to that. My, yeah. I, I probably drive kicking and screaming. I absolutely believe in that. Yeah. And so we, we can, so how is anyone else can give me a, how does this view affect our view of God in terms of how you think of what he's doing? Yes, John. Yeah, it's funny because a lot of people who are reading through the Doctrine of Grace, they struggle with limited atonement. But this, this was my big one because I, I sort of pictured it as, as God just sort of, as, as Jim said, just dra drags the, the believer kicking and screaming against their will into the kingdom. And I, I think in some cases that's the case, but I, I think in other cases it's irresistible in the sense of drawing you and winning you in a way that you, you can't say no to. It's sort of like a, an irresistible relationship or, you know, that, yep. no analogy is perfect. You know, that, that it's irresistible because God has, has changed your heart and you begin to lose the will to resist. It's not that the sinner can't ever resist God. It's just that God, or the sinners cannot ultimately resist God. They, they resist until they can't. Right. No, that, that's a very good point, John. And I think you look at the Old Testament and the picture of how God pursues Israel as even a lover. Even if they're, even when Israel was unfaithful, God is still pursuing them. He's still calling them back. And the picture of the marriage, you know, Christ's relationship to the church, that's what Christ is doing. He's pursuing you. He's, and it's not right. The kicking and screaming thing is not necessarily a good picture because he, can, he does, at the end of the day, bring you into joy. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Your heart changes. I mean, it's, something changes in your heart. Yep. Yep. 
Good. Yes, John. But I think this this one particularly means that a huge focus, if not the focus of evangelism is prayer that God would yes. do this, yes. right? Yes. Because if, if it is a matter that, well, God kind of sets the stage, but the person has to walk through it or whatever, right. then, you know, well, I don't really need, you know, asking God to do more is he's done everything already. Right. Let's just try to get the person to be convinced right. as opposed to recognizing we fundamentally need God to change our hearts. Only God can do that. No, very good point. In terms of prayer and evangelism, this is what we ask God to do, that his grace would be shown and manifested in someone's life, that it would change someone's life. So we can give all, we can read all the scripture and all the, you know, teach them about Jesus intellectually, but that God has to do this. This is what has to happen as a God thing. Yeah. And you said, how does this affect our view about God? I feel like this irresistible grace and limited atonement, when these were presented to me for the first time, it was sort of like, Wow, the opposite of these two just doesn't describe this God. Mm. And you know, like he moved the hearts of kings. Right. Like, like how how could I believe the God of the Bible to be the opposite of these two? Even though these are rough and people struggle with them, right. it was sort of like, oh wow, that's intense that this God is completely ineffectual if it's yeah, and that the other, the opposite, the opposite would be God is inept. He's just kind of sitting around waiting for you to do something. And then you're without hope. I mean, why would you even? Right, right. The hope. Where is the hope? Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Yep. And irresistible grace doesn't stop at salvation. Right. Continues to make us grow. Yes, it doesn't stop at salvation. Thank you. Very good. Yes, excellent. All right, just to go on, perseverance of the saints here and. Um, Everyone that the Father has elected, the Son has died for, and the Spirit has regenerated, would persevere in the faith to the end and will not fall away. Um, and again, this is based upon the other. All these doctrines, we talk about the doctrines of grace. If you just isolate one doctrine without having a kind of an understanding of the other doctrines, then it kind of, there can be some confusion. And so here, if, if you're understanding election and you're understanding God's plan and you're understanding what God's doing in His kingdom and what He's this it makes really good sense theologically and biblically it's argued but there are passages in scripture that warns against falling away because that's the man perspective human experience there are people that are in church today that go and think they're a christian and then they do fall away they don't persevere to the end but they're not true believers is the argument from scripture so there are warnings throughout Scripture that examine your heart. Know that you truly have been transformed by grace. Know that you know God. Know that you know Jesus. Um, anyone have a quick comment on this? This is one that, um, and this is one that I think that I have great confidence, that gives me confidence and hope in thinking about who I pray for. Because if God's done a good work in their lives, he will complete it to the end. It may look like a real bumpy road, but the end of that road is, is Christ, is eternity, eternal life. Yeah. The other way I've heard this one is preservation. It's yes, it's preservation. It leads you more toward God. Right. Yes, God is preserving. He's doing, like, it doesn't just stop, start. Yep. I think this is a good one, and it kind of permeates all, all of these, but it's, it's good, a good place to remind ourselves that God does use means. Mm -hmm. This is not some kind of a robotic fatalism where God's just going to do what God's going to do. But he does use means, and there is a human element and a decisional element and a responsibility element to a lot of these, even though, like you said, we're looking under the hood and seeing God, God at work. There is a, a, a responsibility element for our, the saints, for the preaching of the word, for individual believers in following after Christ, and God uses those things uh, you know, to, to keep them as well. I know you can't say everything there is to say about that, but it's, that's one of the things people struggle with is, oh, that's just a fatalism. And no, God, this is not in any way right. a denial of, no. of means. Right, the means and what God puts, yes. Good, very good point. I'm going to jump on. I have, I, I have to get done. I'm sorry. So um, on, in your handout, I'm not going to go over this, but there's other ways that people have articulated the doctrines of grace instead of tulip, in case you don't like flowers. Um, and so here, I'm not going to read through these, but there's one here, and these are resources I've put on your handout. So finding proof, finding freedom through the intoxicating joy of irresistible grace. 
Um, and so there's the, there's the anacronym of proof. I have it on your handout, so I'm not going to spend time. Um, and then the joy project, which this guy, if you, if you look at this as Tony, well, Tony, he must, he must be associated with John Piper. Yeah, he's, he's associated with John Piper. Okay. So, um, but here's his, he has a book out that is talking about it from a joy perspective of what God does in someone's life and how he transforms them. So if you're not into tulips, these are two things, two good books and resources that talk about the doctrines of grace in a different nomenclature, same doctrines, same biblical uh, truth. So I kind of want to end with, okay, how should these doctrines of grace motivate us to, to godliness? I mean, like Pastor Steve said, this is not something, okay, now once we embrace these doctrines or believe them or intellectually affirm them, and maybe we think our hearts transform, we just kind of put it on cruise control and the Mercedes just keeps going straight. Now we're getting there, I guess, as auto, autopilot cars, but I haven't bought one yet and I don't let James drive. So um, that's not the way the Christian work, life works. We are called, if this is true in our lives, that there is something that God done in our, has done in our life and the engine is running, we are called. So these are a couple points I have in verses. So it helps us, and my focus was a God-centered perspective of God's purposes for his people and his creation. These doctrines, you leave with thinking about God and what he's doing, and hopefully you see it as God's gloriousness and his compassion and his mercy. And that should be always our perspective when we read scripture, God-centered. What am I learning about God? What is he revealing about himself? Yes. Secondly, how does it, what does it reveal, about, reveal about me? And what is my obligations? Confidence that all things are created by, through, and for Christ our Savior. And that's kind of what Jim pointed out. Like, why you can embrace some of these doctrines is because if you have that confidence, this all about Jesus, this all holds together. I love that Colossians passage. Everything holds together. The fact that you're breathing today and even an unbeliever wakes up and has joy in this life is because of Christ. It holds together because of Christ. And we're saved according to his plan for his glory, which we share. We share in his glory, which is, is another whole, whew, that makes me, wow. Which we share and we strive for the prize. This is where Paul, Paul understands this. He's saying, look, don't just put it in neutral or cruise. You strive for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So it should humble us and spur us on to good works. All right, and then I have this point, and I want to read this, and I made this point earlier on, but I think it's something I want to leave your, your minds with before we close, and that is I don't want you to leave thinking that someone who does not embrace all these doctrines, and specifically in the way that we as our church teaches them, is somehow a second-rate Christian. Um, so I'm going to read this dialogue, and this is in a, a book on, on Reformed history. This is a dialogue between, a conversation between Charles Simeon, who is a, a Calvinist, and between our famous, well-known John Wesley and Arminian, who is mightily used by God uh, for evangelism. So here's Charles Simeon. He says, Sir, I understand that you're called an Arminian, and I've been sometimes called a Calvinist, and therefore I suppose we should draw daggers. But before I consent to begin the combat, with your permission, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Pray, sir, do you feel yourself a depraved creature, so depraved that you would never have thought of turning to God if God had not First, put it into your head. And John Wesley, yes, indeed, certainly. Simeon says, And do you utterly despair of recommending yourself to God by anything you can do? And, and you look for salvation solely through the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Wesley, yes, solely through Jesus Christ alone. Simeon, but sir, supposing you were at first saved by Christ, are you not somehow or other saved yourself afterwards by your own works? John Wesley, no, I must be saved by Christ from first to last. Charles Simeon, well, allowing then that you were first turned by grace, are you not in some way or other to keep yourself by your own power in God's grace? John Wesley, no. Charles Simeon, what then are you to, what then are you to be upheld every hour and every moment by God as much as an infant is in his mother's arms? Wesley, yes, altogether. Charles Simeon, and all, and is all your hope in the grace and mercy of God to preserve you until his heavenly kingdom comes? Yes, I have no hope but Jesus Christ. 
Simeon, then, sir, with your leave, I will put my dagger in. For this is my Calvinism, and this is my election, and my justification, and my faith, my perseverance in Christ. It is, all, it is in substance that I have hold, and it, as I hold it, and therefore, if you please, instead of searching out terms and phrases to be grounded, a ground of contention between us, we will cordially unite in those things in which we agree. And the point, I, and I, 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 this was an encouragement to me because my dad died a staunch Arminian. And I tried to encourage him with the doctrine of election and limited atonement. And he never embraced it. But did he love Jesus? He did. Did he believe only in Christ for the salvation of his sins? He did. And I have confidence he knows, yeah, maybe, he's, you know, maybe he got schooled about what's underneath the hood when he went to heaven. But does that matter? Because he's with Jesus. That's the focus. Christ. So don't let these doctrines make you be judgmental. Make them, as the, my last point here, is our union with Christ causes us and enables us to know God's love, obey his commands, and produce fruit. That, John chapter 15, is the, the picture of Christ as the vine. We're connected to the vine. We get our life source from the vine, but we're called to what? Produce fruit. And we're called to love one another. We're called to obey God's commands, but we have to be connected to the vine. That picture is a picture that I think holds a balance and perspective. A balance between the free offer of the gospel, for God so loved the world, to where Peter says here in 1 Peter, therefore prepare in your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We just talked about some of this grace and how it all works. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who is holy, as he who called you is holy, be also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's the purpose and the goal of what's underneath the hood is to make you like Christ. So let the doctrines of grace spur you on to the glories of who God is and what he's done, but to spur you on to good works. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for what you've revealed in your scriptures. It's sometimes hard to grasp how everything works and how you've planned it, but you have been very clear in, in sending your son Jesus to say that this is who you are. This is what you've done, and this is what you've planned. And so, Lord, I pray that you would instill in our hearts through the Holy Spirit stronger faith and the glories of who Jesus is. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.